Hey, everyone. I've got four long interviews with David LeBlanc that I really like. You know, the wisdom on YouTube is that nobody will listen to anything more than eight minutes. And in the 100 plus videos I've uploaded to YouTube, I think I've disproven that theory. It really depends on what people's interest is. And I specialize in Christian origins what we could call the Jesus movement, historical Jesus, Paul, the New Testament, early Christianity, ancient Judaism, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I know the thousands of subscribers that I have love long, in-depth videos. And so whenever I interview with David, we really dive in. And so what you're going to find here, what follows, is one of those programs in which we take a deep dive, and I really hope you enjoy it. And I'm here tonight to discuss with Dr. Tabor his most recent release, which is the Book of Genesis, a new translation from the Transparent English Bible. Uh, I wanna mention right off the bat that this, this translation has been put on sale uh, this month has been drastically reduced in price. I welcome you guys to go to Amazon or any of the other major booksellers that would carry it. Uh, I strongly urge you to pick this copy up. This is going to be an exciting conversation uh, about a, a, a groundbreaking translation. Just to introduce you guys, before I turn the floor over to Dr. Tabor, this is our third conversation together. Uh, one of the, uh, the many uh, endorsements that was uh, written uh, uh, by his colleagues was one by uh, Dr. A.J. Drodge, Professor of Humanities at University of Toronto. Some of you who are familiar with Dr. Tabor's blog would remember this from his blog recently. And he wrote, finally, a truly transparent translation. I have taught biblical texts for almost 25 years and have longed for a translation that didn't pull any punches when it came to the difficult passages, but that didn't try to spin the meaning of the text in the interests of later theology and doctrine or the Jewish or Christian. Tabor's translation of Genesis renders the Hebrew not just with unparalleled accuracy and fidelity to the text, it also offers readers a sense of the unfamiliar elegance and strange power of the original. Beautifully conceived and executed, Tabor's translation is the result of a lifetime of critical learning and scholarly acumen. It is also a courageous undertaking. I have no doubt that it will quickly become the standard. That, that last line, really struck me as I read that. And of course, Dr. Draj is famous for his translation of the Quran, a uh, very well-esteemed uh, scholar and a tremendous endorsement uh, there. So, um, so I'm, I'm thrilled and privileged to have you on again on my channel and, and to discuss this. And I, I guess I, when you first told me about this, I was unaware of the depth and breadth of this project, but it does seem to be something that is uh, 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 quite an undertaking and I guess I would ask to start off with is, is what, what, what got you on this as, as many people would consider you to be a New Testament scholar. Uh, you know, they would see you as, you know, dealing with the historical Jesus or with concepts of Paul and New Testament theology. And here you are diving into a translation of Genesis. Um, and so uh, this might've been a surprise to some of your audience, but, but how did you embark on this project? Good to be with you, Dave. Uh, yeah, we're switching gears here. Instead of uh, ancient Judaism and early Christianity and Jesus and Paul and all of that, we're doing Genesis. Um, I will say this uh, and get to your question. The probably the most influential book in the Second Temple period, that is late, you know, Jew Jewish and early Christian, you know, the problems with calling it Christian, but you understand what I mean, the Jesus movement, which is, I approach as a thoroughly Jewish movement within late Second Temple Judaism, as I know your, your various viewers uh, understand that very well, I think. But Genesis, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, those are the three main texts of the Hebrew Bible that shape and form so many concepts throughout the New Testament as well. So jumping to Genesis, that's not why I did it, but I just want to make that connection, is not a very strange move because this is the text uh, 
I guess you could just uh, badly paraphrase something Paul said once in Acts. It's the text in which we live and move and have our being. It truly is. It's clearly the most influential text on the planet, I would say. Uh, maybe from a Christian standpoint, you might want to say the Gospel of John or Matthew or something like that, or Paul's letter to Romans. But because Genesis includes world religions as a whole, and Judaism and Islam and Christianity, I think you could make the case that it's the most influential book in, on the planet, so to speak, yeah. with all of the Abrahamic connections and so forth. So that alone uh, draws me to Genesis. But my training as a graduate student, of course, I, I focused on, finally, uh, ancient Mediterranean religions, New Testament, early Christianity. But I've always been from undergrad work, undergraduate work, uh, a Bible scholar. And to be a Bible scholar, I mean, I took advanced graduate courses at the University of Chicago in the Hebrew Bible, as well as uh, early Christian texts and ancient Mediterranean texts. And so even though I'm not a specialist, I didn't end up specializing in the ancient Near East. I have an avid interest in it and my Hebrew is pretty good. And uh, so I gave it a try in terms of the translation. That's it is my translation. Yeah, I would yeah. say I gave it a try. <laughs> it is my translation. I did, however, along the way, uh, consult with a number of Hebrew Bible scholars uh, Robert Hawk, uh, another University of Chicago, major, major Hebrew Bible scholar. He's easy to Google and look, H-A-A-K. Uh, I worked with him uh, for over a year on just this translation once it was done in terms of getting all of his input as an expert on Hebrew Bible and other uh, test readers and so forth. So what I thought I would do is, first of all, why is this book different from all other books? You know, not Genesis per se, but this particular translation, you know, what makes it really different? And in doing that, I was just going to jump right in and talk about some highlights. Uh, if you look at, say, Robert Alter's translation, I've got it behind me here, this nice box set. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but since we're talking about translations, this is one I would recommend. I mean, Alter worked on this. We'll put it right there where people can see it. It's a nice three-volume set of the entire Beautiful. Tanakh or Hebrew Bible. Yep. Everybody should have it. It's wonderful. He worked a lifetime on it, and it's really a major work. Everett Fox is another person. I don't think he's done the entire Tanakh, but he's uh, continually working on it. His Torah is out. Uh, Richard Elliot Friedman also has his Torah translation. These would be three examples that would be somewhat uh, similar in the sense that they had a similar vision of giving what I'm calling a transparent English translation. So what do I mean by transparent? It's if I take a page of Hebrew text, here's the page of Genesis one right there that you can yep. see, and you can't read it. You, you probably can, Dave, but yep. many, many people can't read right. it. And so if I overlay an English translation on top of it, you say, oh, I can read it, but you completely lose this. Right. Would there be a way to look through the English and still see the Hebrew, even though it's in English? And it's, could you look through the English and get a reflection of the Hebrew? That's what I mean by transparent. It's my term. Right. Others, I notice others are using it too. I don't know if they got it from me. I started this in 95, so I go back a ways with this, so I'll claim it. But as far as the name, the, the transparent English Bible, I haven't heard anybody use that yet. So what, what are some, let me just tell you some of the unique features. Be, when I was doing this, by the way, I didn't look at Alter or Fox or Friedman on purpose. I didn't want to be influenced. 
I only looked at one thing, this. The Hebrew. That's it, the Hebrew text. Because the history of translations, I've got right here the Geneva Bible uh, 15, I'm trying to read it in the dim light, 1560. One of the oldest, King James is a lot based on that. In people who know the Bible, and I grew up with the Bible, you have these things in your head. I had to literally, I don't want to use the term exorcism, but I had to get rid of those. I had to sweep the slate clean right. so that I was only looking at what was actually in the text. And I didn't want to fall into a pattern of the familiar or things that everybody else had done and so forth. So even though Alter and Fox and Friedman, I highly, highly respect. And since this has been out, I've looked at theirs and a lot of times I'm like, wow, we came up with the same thing. Yeah. But I wanted it to be independent. I couldn't have any of them in my head. And the same with the Koren translation, K-O-R-E-N, the Jerusalem yeah. translation, which I like very much. Uh, Fisher, I think, did that, the one that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other versions of that. Yeah, that's that. the old JPS one, right? Yeah, and then there's the J there's the JPS, the old yeah. and the new as well. Yeah, the so, older the older corn follows the JPS. Yeah. Yeah. So this is new, and I uh, I, I want to just as much as possible uh, make it unique to the Hebrew and transparent. So what are some of the features? I, this is in the introduction. I've got it printed out here. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to talk about it. First of all, I want readers to hear, see, and feel the original text without knowing Hebrew. And I would put the emphasis here on hear and feel. If you take this and read it out loud, it's going to seem a little strange and a little awkward to you. But you saw in some of the endorsements from a couple of linguists right. that you begin to hear the drumbeat, I would call it, of the Hebrew language. I'll give you some illustrations in a few minutes of that. But what happens in English translations is they smooth it out and make it good English. Well, I, if I'm reading the Hebrew Bible, I want the artistic quality of the Hebrew. I call it the drumbeat, the rhythm. Every language has a rhythm, yeah. the way it flows off the tongue. And this English actually does that. And if it seems awkward, just say, well, the Hebrew is awkward. Don't blame it on Tabor. You know, I'm giving you what is in the Hebrew. Also, I want it to be consistent. And I hate to use the word literal, but Droz used it, the idea of accurate, that instead of if there's a single Hebrew word and English might have 15 different words for that concept because English is a, a language with hundreds of thousands of words that we borrowed from all these sources. Good writers want to use a variety of languages. You want to, don't want to use the same basic vocabulary over and over and over. But see, the Hebrew Bible does. And so if it's using the same term, I want to try to be as consistent as possible so you know where you are. And so we'll see many examples tonight, but like if we're talking about a, uh, a living creature, uh, I don't translate it living creature, but that would be the King James. Yep. And anywhere that occurs, that, that Hebrew term nefesh kaya, I'm going to put living creature. I'm not going to say living animal, living being, and just switch it around for no reason, you see? So the idea of being consistent. Um, it's based on the oldest manuscript we have. It's not a critical text. What I do is I take the Leningrad Codex, which I've got right here in Hebrew. I'll hold this up. And the BHS, which many people have, the academic translation, this is the Leningrad Codex, and you can order it uh, on Amazon. It's a Hebrew text, right? but I just translate the Leningrad Codex. And that is our oldest complete Hebrew manuscript. And if the Dead Sea Scrolls have something different, I put that in the footnotes. I don't make, I don't make any judgments on text, the text. Right. So if the Greek Septuagint has a different reading, and I even think it might be 
more accurate. I don't impose my judgment on you as the reader. I want you to always know where you are. In other words, you're reading the standard, traditional, oldest texts from about the 10th or 11th century uh, CE. But the notes, there are hundreds of notes, in the, as you know, in this translation, yeah. will fill you in on some of the main sort of, let's call it variant readings and so forth. Another Can big I feature- for one second that sure. I, I don't want the audience to miss one of the points you just made. You talked about that you don't want to be an interpreter. You want to simply, so a lot of people don't realize some of the one of the statements you made earlier about in the English, because we have so many different words to describe the same thing, we value in the English language, we value diversity of expression. And so one of the things you point out is the fact that many translators have intentionally used different words to represent what is the same word in the Hebrew, only to make it more interesting and consistent with an English sensibility, but that can, can, send, can, can send somebody on a wrong trail in terms of actually being able to interpret the text because it's actually the same word in the Hebrew and it's being different words are being used. So you have these theological biases and different things. So you're trying to avoid all that. You're trying to avoid all That's the right. biases and just give a really honest rendition. Exactly. And that leads into then uh, the basic principle. You probably noticed it in my emails in Hebrew from the words on the basis of the words and in connection with the words. That's my slogan. And what's the idea? Is that if I want to know how to translate a term, and I literally did this, this took me 15 years. I look at every occurrence of that term, not only in the Hebrew Bible, but in major lexicons, it'll even take you into other uh, literature. Hmm. Wow. But I primarily want to do the Hebrew Bible because I want to do the, it's our ancient text. In other words, I want to be as close as possible to what how the text explains itself. And you'll see that in the notes all the time. This is used 10 other times and it means this and this and that. So this becomes something you can really study and delve into. <laughs> you know, usually you need a commentary to yeah. study the Bible. This is your commentary. Well, the I was thinking, itself as I was reading commentary. this, uh, James, uh, you make note of this in the, in the introduction. I remember back when I was trying to learn Hebrew and I was trying to really get into the roots of the language and everything. And you really had to have an interlinear Bible. You needed to have a Strong's Concordance. You needed to have all these tools as you read whatever translation you were reading because you had to unpack the, the layers. But what you've done here is you've basically you basically created a tool where somebody doesn't need to have all those things to be able to get what you would get with all those other tools in, in essence. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Another feature that leads right into that, and you mentioned it, traditional theological terms out. Uh, here's a list. Atonement, covenant, soul, angel, hell, redemption, salvation. Say, how could you have a Bible without those? You mean that's not in the Bible? Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, wow. And those are just some of the loaded ones. Yeah. Wow. Trying to be as literal as possible because right. people then they think they understand something because of some traditional theological meaning, uh, when actually you need to get a fresh look at it. I mean, this. I want people that are listening that have read the Bible their whole lives. They're going to get this. It's going to be a new book. I'm telling you, you won't Exciting, be able to put yeah. it down. I and mean, you'll know the basic stories if you're familiar with the Bible, but you're going to just see on every line, every page, wow, this is so amazing. This is so interesting. This is so fascinating. But it's in the text, not me giving you a commentary on it. Um, yeah. Here's a, a quote I start with that I want to give. It's an old Jewish adage. I love this quote. Uh, one who translates a verse literally is misrepresenting the text, but one who adds anything of his own is a blasphemer. So that was my, those were my parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I am going to be as literal as I can be, 
but I can't have nonsense. Right. Now I do skirt pretty close to the the guardrail of the literal, but I don't go over the guardrail if I think somebody couldn't understand it. Right. And uh, I'm going to give you examples of some idioms and so forth where you'll see. If the idiom is something we can't get in English, then the literal would become nonsense. But if we can get it in English, and a lot of them we can get. One of my favorite is uh, if it says, and Jacob departed and went to Shechem. Typical translation. You know what it really says? And Jacob list, lifted his feet and walked to Shechem. Right. Much different. A lot richer. Yeah. It, first of all, it doesn't say he went. Right. It, that's not what it says. It says he walked. Now, I know halak can mean to go. Rivers walk, too. But that almost reminds you of Native American talk. And actually, when you read this, you're going to kind of be reminded of, you know, what we hear from our Native American uh, brothers and sisters, where they take a more literal, natural thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the river that walks up to Montana. And you say, well, what do you mean it walks? It flows. Well, I'm not going to put flow if it has walk. Right. And you say, well, you're being so literal. That's ridiculous. Well, what? It's an idiom. Right. If Adam and Eve walk, if God walks in the garden, he's not flowing, but it's the same word, you see? Can I, can I say something? Uh, sure, absolutely. This is something that really, really, what you're touching on right now. So years ago, I took several creative writing courses in college, and my professor, who was Jewish, uh, hammered the whole idea of, of avoiding the passive voice at all times, always taking an active voice, an action voice. Describe what you see. Don't tell me what you see. Describe it. Exactly. And as I was reading this, what you're describing in your approach to the translation, I realized what I learned a long time ago that that Hebrew is an action language. It's not a language that lends itself well to the passive voice. It's an action voice. It's an active uh engaged voice and so what you're describing is you're bringing to life uh, a language in its original intent rather than through the passive passivity of later glossings to try to make it smooth that's right and remember people read the bible for all sorts of reasons i've got i've got a jps here i have the 1917 jps jewish publication society I have the the new one I have a RSV, which I like. I have an American standard here. There's different uses for the Bible. I have my old King James here that I've yep. had for 50 years. There are different uses for the Bible, you know, devotional reading, familiarity, quick reference. But for study, for deep study, that's I, this is good for devotional reading, I think. I once you get used to it. Right. But but the idea would be. When you really want to dig into the text, you're going to love this translation. So let me mention some of the specific examples, and then we're going to go to some deep uh, theological stuff in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, some of That's the what I've chosen to talk about. Genesis 1. But let me just give you some. Uh, uh, one of the things you're going to see is what I call noun and verbal consonants. Consonants means when you hear the sound. So here's the NIV of Genesis 1.20, the New International Version. I just picked one of the main Christian translations that's so popular with people. Let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Yeah, not bad. Here's the new RSV. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So there you see dome, expanse, and so forth. Okay, listen to the TEB, mine. Let the water swarm a swarm of living creatures. I'm sorry. Let the water swarm a swarm of living breathers. Life breathers, yeah. Uh, of life breathers. And let the flyer fly upon the land, upon the face of the expanse of the skies. You see, and so you see the consonants swarm a swarm, flyers fly. 
I'm not going to say let birds fly, let flyers fly. You can figure out that it's a bird, but maybe it's other kinds of things as well as birds, you see. And so I do that uh, many, many times to try to show that sort of thing going on. Um, here's one of my favorites. This would be uh, Genesis 1.11. God said, let the land, in this case, it's Eretz, but uh, it, it's basically the land, not the planet Earth. Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants. This is the NIV trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And what I say in the TEB, and Elohim said, let the land sprout the sprout. Literally, you mm. see the alliteration sprout the sprout. Don't you love that? Yeah, I, I think and it's a fantastic. Plant seeding seed. This becomes really important. Uh, I heard somebody say the other day, it was in a comment on my YouTube channel. Somebody said, Well, women don't uh, put forth seed. Oh, wait a minute. In the Hebrew Bible, we have a Torah reading. When a woman seeds seed, it's the same phrase as here. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Put forth seed. So seed is not the spermatos idea of the Greeks, the male seed. That's actually mm -hmm. a chauvinistic idea. But here it's the plants. A plant is seeding seed. Well, we even say that in English. You know, it's, it's going to put forth seed. It's, has it seeded yet? Right. We still do that in English. Yeah. So I want to do that. Also being very exact. Now, here's an example of that. Uh, when God calls the night light uh, day and the darkness, he calls night. Here's my translation. This would be Genesis 1-4. And Elohim, by the way, I, I'll explain that, but I put the names of God or the designation. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. When we get to and it. Elohim called to the light day, called to the light day. And to the darkness he called night. And it was evening and it was morning, day one, not the first day, right? But day one. All the translations put the first day. Now, except for the uh, Koran. Yeah. yeah, the Koran does. So, you know, call to, it's, it's sort of like uh, if I'm giving you a name, I literally throw the name on you almost like i'm making it stick yeah. remember when adam gave names to all the animals yep. it's like i go oh there's a tiger you're the tiger i i call to you tiger tigerness you know <laughs> right now you know i i it's thought about that why not you know are you getting too literal there but this is how you do it in hebrew you call to the thing and then uh, and and then you give it the name, you know. Yeah. It's, it's it's just nice. I think it's nice. I think people like that. Yeah, I agree. Um, now sometimes, uh, how about Adam and his wife? Oh, this Eve? was a, this was a powerful one in Genesis two. Yeah. Yeah, Genesis two twenty four through twenty five. Yeah. So uh, you leave your father and mother. You unite with your wife. You become one flesh. The man and his wife were naked. They felt no shame. Here's my translation. Therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother and join to his woman. It's Ish and Isha. Right. So notice woman still has man in it. Yep. Even though it's English. And man, woman, Isha, the feminine of a man. Right. And they become one flesh. And the two of them were nude. I say nude, and I point out later that that word is the same as the serpent who is nude or slick, and it literally means like the, they're, uh, they don't have any covering, whether right. hair or otherwise, scales, yep. hair, or anything. And then I call him the soil man. Adam is the soil man. Yeah, I saw that. And his woman. Now, I know his woman sounds like, what are you saying? They're not married? No, I'm just saying that there's not a word for wife in Hebrew. If someone is a wife, an isha, it's the same word as somebody's a woman. So you have to define. And, and so, so again, I, Adama. yeah, I, I, I want to be, yeah, Adama, the reason I do it, soil man, is because I want it to reflect the soil. 
the Adama, the Red Dirt. Right. I could have called him Red Dirt Man, but dirt has a, a, a dirt connotation in English. And yeah. so I went with soil. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. And of course, soil can mean like your clothes are soil, but most people's soil they think of as rich and wonderful. Right. You know, the rich soil that grows our food and so forth. Yep. Uh, one of the main ones, um, and we'll take this up in just a minute, is this idea of pain. Like the woman's going to suffer pain in childbearing. And this is even picked up theologically. And it's just people go everywhere with it. It's picked yeah. up even in the New Testament that the woman can be saved through childbearing. Like she's got a, what, a tongue or some kind of. Yeah, pain I love what something. you did with this. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually is it's the word it's bone it just it actually means labor or distress or just hardship and it's exactly the word used later for the man who right, tills the soil yeah uh it's it, it's in it could be just translated toil or labor but i when you look up all the occurrences of its bone it's sort of the idea of uh what we we all know in life it's hard to make a living. And for a woman, it's hard to fulfill whatever role she has. It could be a job. It could be children. It could be the household. It could be all of those things. Right. There, there's a kind of a, a stress to it. It's not walking naked in the garden and picking fruit off of trees, right? Right. we got to go out and work in the soil and make a living and bring your bread forth from the earth. And as you know, in the Jewish prayer, which we say so often before meals. I, I'm not Jewish, but I use this prayer all the time. Who blessed are you, God, King of the Universe, who right, brings who forth bread, bread the from right. the earth? You yeah. see, coming back to this. Well, that takes toil and some degree of stress, you might say. Yeah, yeah. I love what you did with this because this is one of many points where you strip away many of the theological layers that have imposed upon it. And you just give the, the pure rendering and you allow the reader to be able to unpack it without all the baggage that others have placed upon it. Yeah. And we'll talk about some of these more specifically. Now, lots of times you'll get idioms and figures of speech. Like what the English will often do is in Hebrew, you repeat a verb twice and it's for emphasis. Eating you will eat. In the translations in English will say, you will surely eat. Right. You know, like you're really gonna eat. <laughs> so they put in the word surely. Yeah. I thought all of these things, literally, I thought for a long time on some of them. I went back and forth. Maybe I'll just go with that, you know, or underline it. You will eat, you know, with a bold print or something. But no, just I want the rhythm. Eating you will eat. Right. I, I feel the emphasis there. Yeah. Eating, you're going to eat. You know, and you could almost see somebody saying to somebody, you need to eat, eat. You know? Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of the, the Jewish mother telling right. the son, you got to eat. You it's know? almost the same thing as you have like an Italian, the, the old Italian mother, like, you must eat. Come on, eat. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And all kinds of things like Abraham sets out towards the Negev. And when you get up early, you shoulder up. Uh, literally, you shoulder up. What do you do? You pick up your backpack or your yeah. whatever you're gonna, you know, carry and so forth. So all of those things, uh, I I try not to smooth it out. One of my favorite is this one. Uh, it's Genesis two twenty three. There's an expression in Hebrew, uh, zot. It's feminine. It means this one. So here's what Adam says in my translation when he sees Eve. Listen to this. This one, this time, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman because of from a man, this one was taken. Now, why would he say this one three times? Look at your English translations. They'll smooth it out. Mm -hmm. But don't you love the way it flows? Yeah, I do. First of all, he's excited. He's like, this one, this one, yeah. this one. It's much more expressive. It's yeah. less stoic and more, it's more uh, conversational and, and present. And it's, um, it's emotional. I think yeah. he's 
I think he's excited yep. about C. Uh, uh, Isaac loves his food in Genesis 27, the tasty food. Three different times, it's, and, and you'll look at the translation. He'll, he likes it, or he wants it, or he loves it. No, he loves it three different times, and he loves it, and he loves it, and he loves it. So I guess the slogan would be, if the Hebrew is redundant, let's be redundant. Let's well, that's get another the example right there of like of the Hebrew. Oh, sorry, yeah. what you were talking about earlier, like, like you mentioned the NRSV varies there between love and like for no other apparent reason just to break up the monotony of the word yeah. which is not a good reason to do that you know i mean you're calling the hebrew bible monotonous right <laughs> so. right no that's really good right there yeah yeah uh, so let me go to the text uh it's uh, those are some of the features and if the people get the book uh you read the introduction there's a key to it that explains it all uh, can, I, can I bring up one thing sure. before we go yeah, to the go text ahead. so we don't we don't forget about it? So yeah. one one of the sticking points that certain you know, for instance, certain fundamentalist religionists might have a struggle with with this translation. Others won't. Maybe scholarly people, but for many people that don't even know, like many Christian readers, don't realize that our English translations follow the Jewish tradition of not spelling out God's name in in the translation, but putting the capital letters lord and as you point out many people don't know that when you see the word lord in all capitals in an english translation that's there following the, english, the jewish tradition of not uh, pronouncing the name of god but what you've done is you've actually tried to honor the various different names of god that are given in the actual text whether it's yahweh or adonai or el or shaddai and you actually spell that out for the sake of the person who really wants to know what the text actually says and that really serves a very vital function for a studier of the text. Did you want to comment on that briefly and that, and that decision? Yeah, there's a whole section. Um, you know, my Orthodox friends, and I've studied with yeshiva people and so forth, even for Elohim, as you know, they'll say Elohim. They'll say yod Hey vav ke just not to say the hey. So you're getting uh, the fence around right. the Torah, so to speak. You know, where you go two steps removed and then you're not going to ever uh, mispronounce the name or whatever. But one of the reasons I decided to go, that's part of it, is uh, I want Jews to be able to read this. And uh, especially the, the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, that's used over 6,000 times in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so I'm not going to put Yahweh. I'm not going to put Yehovah. I'm not going to put Yahoah and all the other possible variations, partly because I want to leave it to each reader. You know, the Christians, particularly, as you know, in the Messianic movement and so forth, you get people that are all into the sacred names. And if you don't say it just like they think you should say it, I happen to have my views on how it's pronounced. We'll have to do another show on that. I'm not going to go into it right now. No, that's fine. It's a very deep grammatical point. But for the, for the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, Yahweh, or, you know, the, the letters as you pronounce them, I just put, I just put uh, Y-H-V-H and let everybody, is, but, but then great. you know where it is, at least. Yeah, because in, uh, as you point out, and I'll, I will concur with you, and just for the audience that don't know this, that when, when Orthodox Jews and other you know, religious Jews read the text, or any Jew reads the text, the name of God is spelled out in the text. It's just not pronounced audibly. So you would read the name of God and you would say, I don't know, you would say something else, but the text is there. It's not like it's not in the text. It's there. It's right there. Obviously. Right. Although the vowels are supposed to be the vowels of Adonai that are in the right. text. Although Nehemiah Gordon and others have argued that they've found evidence of the Yehovah, but I just wanted it to be neutral on that mm -hmm. where if Jews pick it up or Christians or somebody that only says Yahweh or only says Yehovah or some of the other many variations that people have come up with, it won't matter because you've got the four letters just like you would have in Hebrew. It's transparent yep. to the Hebrew and the vowel points were added later anyway. Yeah, thank you for but, taking the time to explain that. Yeah, sure. So let's start with uh, the first verse, uh, which is really, really important. Um, 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is the way people that other than John 316 for Christians, for God so loved the world and so forth. That's probably, I would say Genesis 1-1 is the best known verse of the Bible, universally speaking. Yeah, I never thought of it till you pointed that out. Yeah. Right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. Mm. Uh, now, to say that that is not a good translation is a real problem. And in fact, when several modern translations started doing this correctly, they were denounced immediately by people and it becomes a marketing problem because I'm not going to buy a Bible that in the very first verse has something very odd to me that I'm not familiar with. And so people just go, oh, forget it. That crazy Bible doesn't even have in the beginning. Can't you see Bereshit in the beginning? <laughs> Elohim, God, created the heavens, the earth. What is wrong with you, Tabor? Okay, so here's the thing about that. Yeah. Bereshit is in the construct. Now, what is the construct? It is a temporal phrase. You don't have to add the temporal nature of it. But here's a, if you take another verse, it helps. Uh, I've got my computer here. Jeremiah 26, 1. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Okay. That's... Sounds all right. But the way most people would read that is in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah period, or maybe son of Zeziah period, like they, it just stops there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A better translation would be, if you want to say at the first, that's very literal. Uh, that's what I chose. Because yeah. I still wanted to stay with in the beginning. But I did add the word of, which is very important. I didn't put in when. I think it's fine to put in when. Like, you could translate this. Dave, let me tell you. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved and hovered over the face of the waters, period. Yeah. And you would go, oh, really? What happened? Oh, that's how it started? What happened next? But right. if I just say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period, that sounds like a singular act with a period after it, and that is incorrect. The Hebrew doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. Just like if I say, at the first of the reign of Zedekiah, same phrase in, he, in Hebrew, at the first of the reign of. So in at the first of Elohim creating, what it's telling you, and this is so important theologically, it's not telling you how the universe began. It's telling you how this particular planet with its sky I'll read it in my translation. Mm. At the first of Elohim, and I did, this is Elohim, not the yod heh vav -Heh. That's not the name. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, what that means. At the first of Elohim, creating the skies and the land, it's like, pause, here's what it was like. Mm -hmm. This is so important to see. And that's, what did he start with? I'm telling you, this is like once upon a time, once yeah. upon a time. And I don't mean fiction by saying that somebody, oh, you're saying the Bible is once upon a time. No, I'm you're saying the style of the, yeah. the style. Like, I'm going to tell you something important. So listen to me at the first, when God began to create the heaven, the sky and the, the land, you know what it was like? It was terrible. It was desolate and empty and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the wind or spirit, you can say wind or spirit here, the yep. Ruach Elohim, right. was hovering like a bird. It's actually Merakevet, like a bird flutters, was fluttering over the face of the waters. And Elohim said, that's where you get the action. Yeah. So the first two verses are telling you what it was like. Now, what I put in the footnote is think of the moon or Mars, which we give a lot of attention to now with their space probes. 
that's describing the condition of the earth when this starts. You follow? Yeah, you know, it's a yeah. desolate, yeah. windswept, empty wasteland. Can, can I there's just no, say as we would power. say today, oh, there's, no, there's no DNA engineering. There's no life forms. Yeah. There's no structure. There's no order. It's chaotic. Right. Go ahead. Well, no, I apologize for jumping on you there. That's all right. Um, I get criticized for that all the time, and I, I, I deserve it. Okay. But the, um, I get it's excited. It's dialogue. It's dialogue. Make it is. Sure. I get excited. I get excited. But one of the things that you pointed out that I think was so wonderful is the fact that you emphasize this at the first. I remember a very famous Jewish midrash says, and I forget if it's Rashi or if it's in the midrash Rabbah, it says, why does the Bible begin with a bet instead of an olive? Why does it begin with a bet instead of an olive? And it's talking about this idea that you talk about here, that it's obvious when you really look at the actual literal translation, rather than thinking in the beginning when God created everything, what we have here is we have something already exists that yes. God is now modifying. He, right. He's creating from something. He's not creating from nothing. And everybody thinks it's creation uh, out of nothing, the ex nihilo idea that's so famous in Latin. The, that's an idea, but that's not the idea here. That's not the literal, right? No. What it's telling you is how this planet got ordered and the different steps, land and plants, and the land animals and humans and you know, the light and the darkness and the fish and the birds and the sun, moon and stars and so forth. It's telling you how it was ordered mm -hmm. in these seven uh, periods of time, however you, you take those. So yeah. that's really important. Yeah, that's uh, I think the, the ordering of, 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 of the land, of, of the earth. And I think, uh, you know, people want to discuss evolution and creation and so forth. And I think it should be discussed in this context that if there's no coding in nature, like DNA is coding, and if nature can spontaneously produce coding, which many, many scientists think it can, that just nature itself can code itself into very intricate order, that would be one idea. This idea is that it takes a force, Elohim means the forces. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's plural with a singular verb. I like to say the force of all forces because I'm compounding the meaning of the plural. The force of all forces oh, that's began to order. That's interesting, yeah, okay. Yeah, because yeah. Elohim is power, force, or whatever. Yep. Um, the short form is L. Uh, you can have El Elyon, the force most high. Mm -hmm. Well, the force most high would be the force of all forces. Right, right. Or you can have the force El Shaddai. Uh, Shad can mean to uh, protect. Or to destroy. Or to destroy. Yeah. If it's protect, it's actually to succor or nurse. Mm -hmm. And if it's destroy, it's like I'm holding a baby in my arms as a mother, and I'm nursing the baby, or as a male, I'm comforting the baby, but I'm also not I allowing mind. anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it can be the force that comforts and protects. You have all these possible meanings, but it's the idea of uh, the force of all forces. So the Bible opens in Genesis with the idea that there's a higher force of all forces that brings about the ordering of the planet and finally brings, you know, the light, the darkness, the birds, the fish, the land animals, finally humans and so forth. And that this planet is that uh, pill blue dot as Carl Sagan said it so famously. Yes. So, uh, so yep. I wanted to start with that, and yeah, I'm not that's taking a these. Right there. Yeah, I'm not taking these in order of just going through Genesis, but that's the first verse when I start with that. The other thing uh, that's really important is when we do get to chapter two, verse four, you get the 
Yod He Vav K or Yod He Vav He, we would say in Hebrew, however you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And it really is explained in other places, particularly in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 3, that the Elohim, the force of all forces of Abraham, uh, that he knew God as El Shaddai, Moses is told, but now he's being revealed as Ehiye Asher Ehiye. Literally, I will be whatever I will, I will be. be. Yeah. And then he says right after that, Yehovah, or if if you understand it as I do, the one who will be and is and was, the right. eternal. And so people call it a name. And more than a name, it's saying that this one is nameless. Because if I name something, this is hard to explain to people. When I name anything, I'm limiting it. I'm trying to give it a tag. And that then, so I become James Tabor. I'm limited to James Tabor. I'm not Dave LeBlanc. You're limited to Dave. I'm James. If I say this is a, I have a hard drive here, external hard drive, I'm naming it. It's not a book. I've named it, I've limited it. Now, how would I name the force of all forces that is not a thing, Right. not a created thing? There's no way to name it. And so the beauty of this Hebrew idea, yod heh vav he, or asher ehiye asher, I will be what I will be, right. is no name. The one who is always becoming, who always was and always will be. And that also distinguishes this concept from all the non, I don't want to say the word pagan because I don't think it's very useful, but all the concepts of deity mm -hmm. among most cultures in which these deities have a beginning and therefore are limited, maybe the sky god or the fertility force. And there's this is trying to say the force of all forces uh, is responsible for ordering the planet. That's the faith of the tradition. Right. And you would say that would even be above the idea of L, because L would actually be below that concept, because L would be a force, would be a god force. Right. Other gods can be El. Other gods right. can be Elohim. Right. Also, but uh, usually you would use the plural verb. Uh, for example, judges can be called Elohim. Right. Because that's what it is in Exodus. They're, for, they're forces. Yeah. Exodus they're 21. Right. Uh, and uh, in Mishpatim, it says uh, Elohim is bring, you should bring forth before the judges, before the Elohim. Before the Elohim. Yeah. Exactly. And then we got the Elohim and the Psalms where. God sits in the council of the Elohim. Right, the judgment. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Psalm 80, is that 82, I think? Yeah, 82. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it, you've got to go by context in terms of what it means. Star Wars, <laughs> the force be with you. And I think what was trying to be developed in those movies was that there would be this sort of ultimate force that you could call upon it would be beyond all the other forces that are battling within the galactic universe mm -hmm. or whatever. Science fiction, but... Kind of a hierarchy uh, of power, yeah. 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 Right. But, uh, you know, if you check into the background of some of the people involved in Star Wars, you realize the Jewish influence. Yes. <laughs> Even Spielberg and so, all those guys, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have that name, and I think... Uh, it really helps to if, to say the force of all forces, and then you need to say to me, well, James, name that force of all forces. And I would say, always is, always was, always will be. I can't limit it with a name like you would say normally a name. Right. So is it name really? You know, this is my name throughout all generations. As you know, it's often explained, Name or Shem in Hebrew can mean my fame. This is my name. This is my fame. This is my designation. Right. And so with this force of all forces, 
it, there can't be a limiting name for it, at least according to this particular text. So yeah, that's beautiful because even like Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, he he uh, he mentions this in his commentaries. My like, favorite of all favorites. Oh, oh, me too, me too. And he he makes this point very explicitly multiple times that it, a better translation is "I shall be what I shall be, not I am what I am," because it's yeah. more of an action. Yeah, I spent two hours with Rabbi Steinsaltz and some of your viewers will know who that is. Oh, yes. And I, I was so honored and uh, I just couldn't believe he wanted to talk to me. And no, what a brilliant man. What such an amazing man and such a genius. Yep. And he was so gracious and we're in his Very home humble, drinking yeah. tea together. And I told my sister later, you know, my sister, Betty, and uh, Ellie Sheva, Elizabeth is her, her full name, but Betty, her nickname. I, she said, wow, that would be like the main person you would want to meet in the rabbinic world. Yes. I said, well, other than... A couple, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, chief yeah. rabbi of Britain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and it was such a loss. He was only 70, and Rabbi Steinsalz, he only passed away, I think, less than two years ago. Yeah. yeah. And Sachs passed away last year unexpectedly. Yeah. Year. And, of course, we have Sachs' translation also now of, of, I think, the Torah. I don't know if it's I the have that time. one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me go on. The other thing uh, I'll mention here, these are kind of gleanings from Genesis. Uh, so we've talked about the uh, verse 1, and then the Elohim, and then the, the yod heh vav -Heh. What about good, 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 and very good? <laughs> and very good is uh, tov meod in Hebrew, you know, very good. Right. Uh, that's seven goods. They don't exactly <laughs> correspond to the uh, days because mm -hmm. a couple of times you get a double good. Uh, but at the end, you get all that God created was good. This is such an important concept because it means that the material world as people denigrate it. I don't accept the term spiritual and material. This is my own view of philosophy. Right. Einstein sure. should have taught us that E by E equals MC squared, that the thing we call like, here's my what, this is material, this is stuff. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. In it, I have H2O. I don't know the formula for, I think this is probably aluminum, but uh, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. I'm hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, but I'm talking to you. Right. And I'm probably 99% hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. But just, I think if you took all the water out of a human being, I, I read this, when we cremate, which I don't want to get into a morbid subject, but you still have several pounds of, you know, carbon, but uh, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, particularly if it's broken down, I mean, we, we are, you know, we're just dust in the wind also, right. uh, made dust of the ground. So it's really important to see that this uh, created world of, that we inhabit on this planet Earth, this good Earth, this good, 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 very good Earth is not a prison it's not a dark place into which we've fallen. None of these Gnostic, Hellenistic views that begin to integrate yeah. the creation. Mm -hmm. The creation is good, and it's very good, and it's to be celebrated. And we have other verses in the Bible where the Elohim sing for joy at the creation and so forth. The other mm -hmm. forces sing with the force of all forces and so forth this sort of poetic idea. And I think that's really important because most religions, in fact, just about every religion, except for maybe Confucianism, which I'm not sure it's a religion, uh, they tend to be dualistic, right. except for the Hebrew Bible, which is uh, monistic, meaning there is the force of all forces, but it's, an, it's of a nature that is one with what we're calling the material as if it's some kind of holy other thing. But it's actually configurations of energy and bringing order out of chaos and so forth. Right. 
and physics is telling us that more and more. You know, you talk about uh, the, the problem in our world is we think if we name something, we've explained it. So a physicist will, and I respect, you know, I listen to Robert Kuhn, Closer to Truth. Everybody should listen to Kuhn's stuff. This brilliant Jewish brain scientist and philosopher, closer to truth.com. He does cosmos. I'll have to check that out. Cosmos, consciousness, and meaning. Okay. And yeah, he interviews right. everybody, atheists and believers and theologians and yeah. physicists. So they I've been will listen all to tell you. Stuff. Uh, have you heard of Lex Friedman? Oh, yeah. One I, of my love, I love his podcast. He has a lot of people yeah. talk about that stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah no, I'll have to check that out. Especially way. Roger Penrose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I have heard him. Well, it's amazing because one of the things, this is tangential. I don't want to spend more than 30 seconds on this because this is about your translation. But one of the things that fascinated me about Kabbalah is how the Kabbalah really was walking in step with a lot of the scientific advancements that have happened in recent, uh, even recent decades. There's been a lot of things in quantum physics and quantum mechanics and what right. have you that are actually like reinforcing a lot of right. the mystics beliefs uh, that were considered to be kind of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know want to say hocus pocus, but kind of this mystical esoteric knowledge that is now being right. uh, Right. supported by science and that's really a fascinating development to me yeah so, so anyway. what i was going to say is we so the physicists will tell us there are four forces we're talking about forces right Elo, elohim the force of all forces there's gravity the electromagnetic field and the strong and weak nuclear forces those are the four forces of the quote material world now by naming it if i say well what's gravity say well it's gravity but what is it? It's it's the force, gravity. Right. What is it? How does it, it? Yeah. How does it attract me to this planet so I don't fly off? Like, what's the mecca? It, it it's a force. Right. You it's can't. It. Right. And, and then you say light. Well, we don't even agree if it's wave or particle. <laughs> you say and the strong yeah. and weak nuclear force. What we're describing is observable phenomena sometimes called behaviors mm -hmm. we're not explaining the deep deeper sense like, of where's it all from? right exactly right exactly. so i think that's hinted at by by this multiple use of good now that's not so much a translation thing but i just wanted to point that yeah. out um now here's a translation thing why do i translate uh humans as living breathers or life breathers. This is very important. Because in the standard translation, God breathes into the man, the breath of life, and Adam, the man, becomes a living soul. First of all, I don't think it's the name Adam. It's the soil man that he's just made out of the soil. Yeah, he's made out of the soil. So the, the Adama. Mm -hmm. Out of the Adama comes the Adam, the soil thing. Mm -hmm. So the soil thing, and then he breathes into it the breath of life. So what people do here is they go to Greek theology and Greek Hellenistic dualism, and they say, oh, this is the immortal soul. Humans have this special soul and animals don't have it. So let's translate it and humans became, and man became a living soul. And you've heard mm -hmm. sermons on this and so forth. And the body's just the body and you get into Greek dualism. Right. But what it is, yeah. nefesh kaya, a living breather, nefesh is the neck. It's actually the throat. Yep. So a living breather is an animal. We are animals. It breathes the breath of life. Exactly. That breathes. That breathes. Now, fish also have the breath of life. It means that they're spoken of as also having the breath of life. So it's not some mystical, you know, mysterious thing. Uh, any creature with the breath of life, if it's deprived of oxygen, it dies. And so there, there is the idea of eternal life. It said in chapter three, the tree of life that can give you eternal life. Yeah. But it's not inherent in the soil man. The soil man 
is a living breather, but the creatures in chapter 1, verse 20, 24, 2, 7, it's all the same term. Mm -hmm. Nefesh kaya, living breather. There can be a dead nefesh, a dead soul, because soul in old English just meant individual. You know how people used to say, 20 souls perished in that shipwreck. What, right. what immortal souls perished? Right. No, people, people. People, yeah, their lives souls. were extinguished, yeah. Yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the old idea that people get mixed up. And I think it's really important because it, it, it's important for the tree of life, when you get to the tree of life, to understand. So humans are soul creatures. They're dust of the earth. Uh, when you die, you return to the dust. The breath of life goes forth. There are other passages, not in this place, that talks about the spirit returning to God who made it and so forth. But whether that is a mystical idea or just the idea of the breath goes forth is uh, something that, that would have to be discussed. Mm -hmm. Now, another uh, passage I'll refer to is uh, 224. Humans are in the image and likeness of uh, the Elohim. Let us make humans, male and female together. And you have this idea of the King James that became a word in English, a help meet. Yeah. And today you'll hear people say, I grew up in the churches of Christ and the old preachers would get up and say, now woman was made as a help meet for yes, man. That's what they would say. And they yes. make it a word, like there's a thing called a help meet. It's an actual defined, it goes back to that definition of terms again. Yeah. And so uh, it's kunigdo. It actually means the thing corresponding to him opposite. <laughs> wow. Now, here we're going to have to get a little bit uh, adult because a car, male, is to press or thrust, okay? Uh, it also means to remember, because press that in your brain, press mm -hmm. it, okay? But it also refers to sexual intercourse. Right. A male is the end, even in Latin, malus and female, okay? Not a normal Latin term for female. Nekeva, nekeva, is cavity or receptacle let's say okay. receptacle so it's actually like a lock and a key yeah any electrician knows the terms what kind of plug do i need male, male or female. female yeah right this is it's nothing you know that people should snicker over or something right. it shows the frankness of the hebrew bible yep but the word meat is the old English word, which means fitting. So a help, etzer, kunigdo, means a partner, a helper, that will correspond to him exactly. So that when the two come together, and it's not just speaking of sexuality, of course, but when the two embrace, the man and the woman, when you have the maleness and the femaleness come together, you have a reflection of the Elohim, of the force of all forces. Mm. And that's interesting because it, it says male and female made he them, created he him, made he them. So you get the singular idea yeah. that, that they're both. And the two then become one. Now, the two become one is usually translated or understood as sexual intercourse. But it could also mean, and rabbis point this out, uh, children. Because yeah. if you think about it, my DNA is a Y, y DNA as a male and a female as mitochondrial. And if I have my child, either a male or a female, they literally take from both of us and they carry our DNA, as we now know. Right. We understand this. Side, yeah. And so the two actually do become one. Yep. And so it can mean both, I think. But I think what's important is to see that the image of God is reflected in both. And that's important in this uh, particular chapter. 
And I don't want to derail you in any effect. way. Uh, I was going to ask you, what do you make of the fact that all of a sudden in, you know, chapter four, we have the beginning of yod heh vav -Hey Elohim blended together, whereas before we just have Elohim. Do you, do you see? I know that's one of the big contentions of the of the uh, documentary. Well, it's talking. actually uh, it's it's actually in chapter two, right? Oh, chapter, chapter two. I'm sorry. Did I say four? Yeah, yeah I did. I yeah. said four. Sorry. Yeah, two verse four. Yeah. Elohim. yeah. Well, that would be uh, Genesis one up through two three is a separate account which uses just Elohim. Mm -hmm. the, it's uh, called the hymn of creation. Now, the biblical, the biblical scholars have said that this is written by a priestly group. They call it P. Right. And, uh, and the reason they do that is because it mentions these festivals, days, seasons, months, years, and so forth. Uh, I've never been convinced of that. I'm not talking about the source theories or anything like that. I just think this stands alone as an epic piece of beautiful poet, poetic writing. Uh, I think it might be the most, by far the most beautifully written creation hymn. Uh, there are other creation hymns, the Enuma Elish, and there's some Indian Sanskrit creation hymns. Uh, I think they all have their value. I particularly like the Hindu ones that are the ancient ones because mm -hmm. they actually sound a lot like this. Yeah. You know, before anything was, before any, they kind of had this sort of Elohim of all Elohim idea. But just poetically, it's beautiful. But when you get to 2 4, mm -hmm. and, you, and that goes in through chapter three, then through the end of chapter three, that is a different uh, story of creation. So they're clearly two parallel stories. Yep. And however you explain that, it's kind of resetting things. And it's introduced by this term, the toldot. And it's usually translated generations, but it's yalad is to bring forth. And it's used 10 times in Genesis, as you know. And it always uh, tells you... Uh, now I'm going to tell you about, and it could be the story of Joseph or the story yep. of Jacob. It could be the story of whatever, Esau. So this is the told dot of the skies and the land, which claims to be different from what we just read. So there's a definite switch. These are the bringing force of the skies and the land in their being created in their being created. I'm reading you my literal translation. Yep. So that's what it is. You say, well, what is two, four through chapter three? It's the bringing force of the skies and the land in their being created. Now I'm gonna drill down and give you some details. In the day of the making of yod heh vav -He Elohim, land and skies, which we just read about, and no shrub of the field was on the land and no plant and so forth. So it's coming on down to a place called Eden. And it's talking about some rivers and a garden. People talk about the Garden of Eden. Notice it's the garden in Eden. Right. Eden is a region. And it's referred to here by these four rivers and described. So now we're getting a not an overview of say, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, it was without form and void, but we're getting down to talking about the creation of the land in this area of Eden, planting a garden east in Eden and putting the soil creature and so forth. So it is a, a kind of a alternative or second account. Yep. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem for people. I think it uh, is making very different points. And some of the points that uh, I want to look at our time here. How long have we been recording? Uh, we've been roughly, I think, about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, we'll go a little bit more, a couple of points. One thing I want to mention, and this is just kind of hit or miss. Uh, I mentioned the parallel between... Uh, 
nude and shrewd. Yeah. Uh, this word arum is really interesting. Yeah. Be because uh, the two of them are nude. This is verse 25 of chapter two of Genesis. Mm -hmm. The soul creature and his woman. It, but the nakash, usually translated serpent, and I don't put serpent, and I explain in the footnote, it's actually uh, was shrewd, same word. So I was thrilled to think of nude and shrewd, and then later I think it was either Fox or Alter or somebody else did it too. Oh, so yeah. that was my why I didn't. You were like, woo. <laughs> I didn't want to look at them because I didn't want to copy, but then I go, wow, this is really good. I like yeah, it. Makes you feel, yeah. Because I, I wanted uh, I wanted people to see that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's it even rhymes, you know. Yeah. And so what is the idea? He's slick. He's slick. He's shining. He's the shining one. Nakash uh, means a shining one. It's actually the word for brass, polished brass. Very you know, interesting. The, yeah. the, brass, yep. the brass serpent mm -hmm. is translated. It's actually a Nakoshet. Yep. You know, it was destroyed by, what was it? Uh, Hezekiah destroys it ultimately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it's going to go in its belly. And yeah, it seems like it's sort of like a snake, but this is very poetic. And I think it's, if you don't mind the word uh, mythological, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, but. Right. I think the the this is a symbolic way of talking about humans facing the knowledge of good and evil. So he's the shining one. He's the slick one. He's shrewd. They're nude and he's shrewd. They're defenseless and they're naked and they're innocent. They're like children and they don't know good and evil. Mm. So let's talk about I said good and evil. I translate it good and bad because evil puts a different twist on it. Yeah, that's more theological. It's maybe. literally tov and ra, right. good and bad, just right. like in English. You have good and you have bad. So what is, uh, what is it to have the knowledge of good and evil? It's the experience, literally, to know good and evil. Like Adam knows his wife. He knows her sexually, and she has a child. So to know good and evil is to experience good and evil. We only have one other place that this is explained it's in deuteronomy chapter one i think it's verse 39 where moses refers to children who do not yet have the knowledge of good and evil so i'm going to present to you based on this translation of knowing good and bad and then the eyes being opened and they become as elohim knowing good and evil mm. that this is a coming of age idea rather than a okay. fall yeah. a fall of humans or humans disobeying and being punished if little children don't yet have the knowledge of good and evil at some point if they're going to become wise and know good and evil like the elohim of all elohim in other words if you're going to become on the god level that you were created to become, mm -hmm. you have to mature. And right. when you mature, you begin to make your own choices as any God would do. And we are little gods. He said, what the Nakash says is, if you eat this fruit, you will become wise like the Elohim. Knows you'll understand right and wrong and good and evil and make your choices. And then... You got to leave Eden. Now, he doesn't say that, but God says that, or right. Yahweh Elohim says that, or Jehovah Elohim, or yod heh -Vav -Heh Elohim. I'll get in trouble with people <laughs> picking one of the names. And he says, uh, he says, the tree is desirable, and they eat it, and the eyes of them were open, and they knew they were nude. A little child runs around naked and yeah, you think twice it. about it, right. right? Yeah, but when you become a, a man or a woman, when you reach uh, puberty or adolescence, you become. It's partly a reference to sexuality, I think, but not yeah. just sex. No, it's just also the idea maturity. of becoming uh, a mature person. Uh, yeah, Christians. No, I, I, I know you don't want to get into theology here, and I'm not going to go down that route yeah. because we're already so much into this, but. Um, 
I just think it's beautiful. One of the things that I really struggled with in my journey and my own personal journey, and I, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but was the idea of the Christian concept of original sin, yeah. which it's almost like guilty before you even have a chance to come out yeah. of the chute. And, and yet when I learned in Judaism that that isn't a concept within Judaism, that it's more of this concept of, of coming of age. And, and as, as I started realizing that every culture in the world, including our own, has our own tradition of what it means Absolutely. to come to age, yeah. come to maturity, and you don't hold a two-year-old responsible for right. decisions it's not able to make. And, and Christians call it age of accountability. Jews recognize it as becoming bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, meaning you are responsible for the mitzvot, the commandments. You yeah. become a moral creature. It's a common concept within a, a right. cultural, yeah. Now, why can't you have the tree of life if you leave Eden? Because they're put out of Eden. Lest they should take of the tree of life and live forever. And the reason is, it's not explained, but it's implied, is they are destined to have that eternal fellowship with God. But not as innocent children. They have to have it based upon them becoming something that is actually their individuality right so it's not a punishment to leave the garden it's it's a, necessary it's a consequence part of, of growing up and right. uh i tell them i have such trouble when i teach this with students because i tell them you've all left eden you're you're in your 20s you've all according to moses 20 and below he's pretty yeah. liberal with it i like that because uh, sometimes I think my kids need into their 20s and 30s. <laughs> and my daughter's a therapist, and she said, Dad, males don't mature till 30. <laughs> till way into their can't 30s. argue with the therapist. <laughs> I think she might be right. You know, she, I think she is. is. This yeah. is what she learns. But yeah. Moses said 20. 20 is a good. Yeah. Now, of course, we have. They say 30 people, is the new 20. So people do horrible things. Uh, 13, 14, 15, and so forth. And we do have to make some kind of yep. judgment about that. We usually say 18, you know, tends to be our, our age. But we're still doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this thing about the fall, see, the fall goes with, this is a dark, evil world. Right. And we fell into this world. It's a paradox. And somehow Eden was good. And then we're put into this dark world and we die and we need redemption and salvation. And it's not that at all. It's actually a beautiful idea that you can become an Elohim, a God, yeah, right. on the earth, knowing good and evil, mm -hmm. and begin to make your own choices. Now, it's very scary. And I am getting beyond the translation. No, you are, but we're getting back into That's this all right. theology, it's right? It's very scary because a human being can do anything within their physical and mental power anything yeah that's so frightening this well this goes back to people that can pull out guns and shoot people people right. can lie and cheat and steal and people also can be incredibly loving and sacrificial and good yeah everyone is creating themselves that's right into an image right because they have the knowledge of good and evil yeah and no, that I, yeah totally. is when the I, implication when I, I just, of Eden. Absolutely. My last, my last statement I'll make on that, and then we'll we'll get to where you want to wrap up here. But the um, in my memoir, which I'm not trying to plug my memoir, but just mentioning in my memoir, I was talking about uh, how people a lot of times want to criticize religion as religion has caused this and religion has caused that, and we have to remember that religion technically has never done anything. People do things. People build orphanages, people blow up buildings, people murder other people, people love other people, people forgive other people. It's people sure. that do those things. It's not a religion that does those things. Yeah. So it's, it's these core ideas. Yeah. That, yeah. Anyways, but yeah, so. So this is. Sorry, back to what we're talking about here. Yeah. The, the translation is not going to give you all that we've said. Right. But you're going to find when you read it, it will fit better in terms of saying the knowledge of good and bad for example yeah, that's really good. evil and there's no word fall or anything like that and it's it's consequence more than punishment uh it's inevitable 
you know, Bob Dylan has a song, I bit into the root of the forbidden fruit. And he's, you think of like eating a peach, you know, you're from yeah. Georgia. He said, and the juice ran down my leg. So he's like, you know, eating the forbidden fruit. Well, this is how we are. Yeah. Our, my parents didn't know anything when I was 14. Are you kidding? I left Eden. Yeah. I knew everything. And Cain killed his brother Abel, too. They left Eden. That's right. They, outside the gates of Eden, which is another Dylan song. Yes. Outside the gates of Eden, what goes on? Everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But incredible good as well. Yeah. And that is human history and its reality. Mm -hmm. And Genesis introduces the story of one man's family. Yep. Lots of other translation things. For example, uh, people say today, the goy, the goyim, that means Gentile. Completely wrong, as you know from Hebrew. <laughs> you know, the, the nations and the nation are the same word. Right. I will make of you a great goy. That's right. What, you're going to be, Abraham's going to be a great goy, a Gentile? Yeah. No, he's going to be a great nation, see? Right. Uh, and, and so that that is correct in this translation. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I want people to get it. I want them to read it with great pleasure. There's so many discoveries. I think it has, how many footnotes does it have? I don't want to scare you. I didn't get a chance to explore all I think of it has uh, about a, a thousand footnotes. Yeah, it's really well. So let, let's wrap up with that. So let me let me ask you this last question as, as we wrap up our time here. Um, I think this is a very exciting project. Um, what is, I guess, two things, I guess more practically for the present moment, if you want to just take a moment and just let people know again that this is on sale and where they can find it and, and what your plans are for this project, where you're going with this. Yeah, well, you know, I have done quite a bit on other books like I've done Exodus, I've done parts of Deuteronomy, I've done big parts of some of the prophets, some of the Psalms. Um, I'm not sure. I decided to put out Genesis as almost like a shooting up a flag and seeing if it catches on, if people mm -hmm. like it. I think what I've developed is a method. And the method is I've taken every major word and concept in the entire Hebrew Bible, even though I've only produced Genesis in this form that I'm ready to put out, and come up with, uh, we have lists and lists of this on the computer database of what the meanings are and how to translate and so forth. And then what you simply do, and I would have to have help doing this, because I'm not going to live long enough to do the whole Tanakh. But the idea would be that most of the work has already been done, but we haven't put it together yet, believe it or not. Yep. Uh, and so now that we know the method, like how idiomatic are you going to be? How literal are you going to be? Right. How are you going to translate this particular verbal construct? For example, I, I show the Hifils which is the causal verbs all the way through. That's very important. It, you know, these little superscript letters yeah, that, that we yeah. didn't talk about that occur throughout. So if a word is uh, plural, for example, like nefesh kaya or nef ruach kaim, mm -hmm. one is Kaim's life, plural, yeah. one is lives, okay? Mm -hmm. Etz and etzim, tree yep. and trees. Right. Now, usually translations don't worry about that. You just put what makes sense in English. Like, is Adam hiding in a tree or in the trees? It happens to be ets, as I recall. So is he just hiding in a bush, in a single right. tree, or is he hiding among the trees, you see? I'm not going to interpret that for you. Right. But I'm going to equip you to do it because I have a little S or a little P by any noun that you might not know by English that it's singular or plural. Remember the Torah reading, the lives of Sarah? Yes. The lives of Sarah. 
every translation puts, it's the life of Sarah. What are you saying? The lives. What did she live? Many lives. Everybody lives many lives. Right. That's how you say it in Hebrew. Yeah. Now, I would put life, but with a P, because I don't want to get silly with it yeah. and make it where people think they're getting a deeper meaning when maybe it's not even there. But a lot of times uh, there's a plural, uh, you, you like blood can be bloods and so forth. You know, you it, it's just the way Hebrew is. Yeah. But any time you're reading this, you're going to know, is it singular or is it plural? There are things called causal verbs. And instead of saying, you know, like he made this, but if it's causal, it's not just that he made it, it's like he caused it to come forth. That idea, you see. You, you know, I'm excited about this. I think anyone who's done serious Bible study is going to understand exactly what you're talking about. But for those who might be skeptical and thinking, oh, here we go, another one with another translation of the Bible you know, just to add on to the dozens of others, you know, this is just another way to make money or whatever, some skeptical person. But yeah, we have scholars here that have endorsed this that are really excited about being able to use this in their classroom. And so I think you've answered the question with what you just described, but just for the sake of the person who may not be familiar with this kind of stuff, uh, why is this translation so exciting for many of these academic scholars that are teaching Bible in college? I'll tell you why, because uh when you're teaching, you always say when you come to a certain Hebrew thing, like say, a help meet for him, you say, now actually the Hebrew doesn't say that. And then you tell what the Hebrew really says, like Genesis 1-1, we did tonight. In the beginning, God could, actually the Hebrew doesn't say that. And the students always raise their hand after you've done that about 10 times. <laughs> Dr. Tabor, you're always telling us what the Greek really says or the Hebrew really says. Well, why isn't there a translation that gives us what it really says? That is what I was just saying. Yeah. Yeah, and what this means, yeah. students that are studying Hebrew, if any of your uh, viewers or listeners are studying Hebrew, Genesis is a good book to, is a good book to start with because it's narrative. It's a story. Narrative is easier than poetry. Yeah. It's got poetry in it, but it's mainly narrative. It's yeah. a good book. But this That's how I learned a, how to read Hebrew was in Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. This would be a great guide as you're studying and trying to read Genesis to have this as your English uh, companion. Yeah. Because it won't lead you off. It'll actually take you back more into the text that you're actually reading. That's so it becomes yeah. useful for that. So, yeah, we, we reduced the price. It's like $18. Mm-hmm. And uh, Amazon is the place to get it. I published it through Amazon yep. uh, just because I did it myself. But I would say if I can get the right team together and I would become the chief editor and then have a series of people working on other books and we're willing to use this method, mm -hmm. we, can, we could get this done. We that could would actually be exciting. have. Yeah, I hope that comes together. Yeah. And my guess would be we would do the Torah first. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a real good marketing strategy because so many, even Christians now, are interested in Torah studies. Yep. Oh, one thing we didn't mention, Dave, is the white spaces. Oh, yeah. You didn't get into that. Yeah. yeah. This is very important. In yeah, the Hebrew text, there are all of these white spaces, large and small that separate out sometimes a single verse or a paragraph. Yep. It's the actual original divisions right. of the Leningrad Codex. And they're very interesting to read. And in Genesis, but also particularly in the prophets, I find them just fascinating. Yeah, And, and, and it's as if yeah. you're pulling out something yeah. and maybe emphasizing it some way. And so you'll see that it comes uh, very early on, um, I think, let me just look in the first few chapters that we've covered. And the rabbis comment on those spaces. They, they actually make midrashim on those. Exactly. Yeah, there's one in, uh, there's one in chapter 3, verse 16. Yep. All of a sudden, it's just a gap. Yeah, it's and, just a gap. I actually going? studied that. I actually looked up Rashi on that to see. Let's see what Rashi has to say. But he didn't have anything yeah. too interesting, so I left it alone. But So it's one of the few, the, the Koran 
K-O-R-E-N, published in Israel, uh, that puts them in some of the other Jewish translations. Yeah. But none of the standard English translations That's right. uh, put these in. They come up with their own paragraph markings and so right. forth, which again is giving the sense of our English idea of paragraphing and marking sections as we would see it. But I, you know, I we got this old manuscript that's, you know, the Leningrad Codex. I want to show you uh, wh where they put their uh, yeah. paragraph divisions and section divisions and so forth. So yeah, no, because they're dealing with scrolls back then, where we're dealing with books. It's hard for us sometimes. If you've never seen a real Torah scroll unfurled right. for a reading, you don't necessarily appreciate necessarily how this all works. You know, and it's not the chapters. A lot of times, sometimes it is the chapters, but lots of times there'll be a there'll be a long section and yeah, you see mid, the chapter section, right yeah. in the middle. Why is the chapter there? Right. Why don't they break it? Because the text didn't break it. So yeah, basically, uh, I think people love it. Now, if people like Kindle, this is nice too. I put the notes in the back, and you know, some people like them at the bottom. And I know you have to go back and put a marker and look. But the reason is I want people to read it. Right. And if you're always looking down. Yeah, you lose that flow. You lose yeah. that sense. So they're yeah. in the back. But if you have the Kindle version, which is nice, when I'm reading it, I like to use the it just Kindle. Just flows like, just like that, yeah. Well, you hover over the note and it pops up. Oh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, I haven't it just read it pops up. Okay. Oh, wow. I'll, also, have to, I'll have to check that out. Also, if you have the Kindle, you can do searches for words and all that. So it's See? actually a little bit more user-friendly. Yeah. I think it is. Some people don't like it. I like books myself, but I've started using, I'm That's using Kindle more books. and more because I, I like the search features and I like, uh, but in this particular book. So I hope people will uh, get a copy. Uh, we got this summer sale going. We'll put the price back up to normal. I think it's normally like 25 and I mm -hmm. took it down with it. It's, it's a great 18 bucks. Uh, I think they're going to love it. It, it it's going to renew your sense of all kinds of things. And I would agree. No, I, I'm really I'm, so. Thank you for taking this time to uh, yeah with us. Great. Okay, Dave. And all right. We'll talk in the future about other things. I Every, guess, yeah, so. definitely. Please uh, follow James on his blog, jamestabor.com. Uh, if you like this interview and others that we've done, please like and subscribe to my channel and also to James's channel as well. And uh, and we'll look forward to our future conversation. Uh, and thank you very much. Have a great. Yeah, evening. I've got about uh, I put up about a hundred videos. On yes, my you YouTube. have. Just in the last couple of months, some of no, them. No, it's been years, unbelievable. So. That just and a lot of the lectures from like years ago that on really yeah. interesting topics. Yeah, I, I've been trying to devour it as, <laughs> as I can. Yeah, but uh, no, thank you. It's it's great. So it's James Tabor videos on YouTube and jamestabor.com. Uh, so I hope to keep in touch with uh, all your people and uh, yes, most definitely. We'll do we'll do some more things later. Yeah, thanks for sharing and have a, have a great evening. And uh, and if I don't talk you, to you before, then you have too, a great Yeah, thanks so much. All right. Okay. Bye bye. bye.